keeping your garments. You're keeping tender before the Lord. I don't think there's any danger of anybody blaspheming the Holy Ghost. I don't live in fear of that. I don't live in fear of that. Uh, he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of love. I don't live in fear of that because I know that I am striving to be perfect. I know my sins that are committed. I know, I know my weakness. I know my failure. But I never, never, never justify myself. I see the flesh, it's flesh. I see the spirit, it's spirit. I don't try to equate the flesh with the spirit, the spirit with the flesh. You know, the fle flesh is flesh. Spirit is spirit. Jesus said that to Nicodemus, didn't he? He said, flesh is flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you, I don't fear that uh, because I know if I did, and I do, and I would justify myself in breathing the Holy Spirit, I would become twice dead. Dead once, and I'm going to come to that scripture, in the Adam nature, and I will die in that Adam nature physically. That's one, that's one death. And then dying again spiritually when my body does die and go back to the dust, my spirit dies and it's my spirit that is twice dead. See, the body is not twice dead because the body, your body was never dead. Your body came from the womb of your mother, a living soul. So it, it, it was not twice dead. It will die once. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. My brother Ernest had a thought over here way back when I, I, I skidded past him. I think I did you last time, didn't I? I'm sorry. All right. Uh, actually, uh, baptism in Jesus' name is the union of man with spirit because, well, in Romans, Six and three it says, Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into death. So the uh, word repent, even the word repent in the Greek army, instead of saying about face like they do in the military in the United States, they say repent. And that means it's about face, you turn around from the direction you're going. And According to Romans 5, we are baptized into his death, the symbol of dying out. So if we die out to sin, uh, I don't, it's a union with Christ, and we come out like he came out of the tomb, we rise from that death with him. And I don't, the uh, saint of God, unless they back somebody to get in bad shape, I don't think they're going to blast in the Holy Ghost. Because I don't know that. They'd have to be in bad shape. They'd have to be in bad shape. I think they would have to qualify through to get by the Ferris order. And there's a lot of, I'll come down to Gail and Ginger back here. You would have to qualify to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. One chapter you would have to measure up to qualified of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is uh, Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Uh, now read that carefully and see what you must do in order for there to be no repentance for that. Uh, quite a list of things there. Four doctrines. You would have to know the four doctrines. You couldn't be a babe. You know, you don't judge a babe like you do an adult. You would have to be an adult, Christian, know the four doctrines, uh, the powers of the world to come, uh, taste the good Holy Ghost, taste of the powers of the world to come, or to have a vision of the bride of Christ, and you're ruling with Christ, and uh, uh, measure up to those qualifications of Hebrews 6 uh, in order for you to blaspheme the Holy Ghost, I'm like you, Brother Ernest, I agree with that. That you'd have to be in pretty bad shape uh, to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. 
you know, to go against, uh, you know, um, the, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is called the sin unto death in, in John 5, isn't it? Uh, the, the first John 5, uh, there is a sin that is unto death, and I do not say that he shall pray for it. Um, let's see, verse uh, 15, 16, chapter 5, 1 John, 1 John, chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. And we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, in other words, pray for him. Mm -hmm. And he shall give him, he, Christ, mm -hmm. shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There's repentance. Mm -hmm. There's justification. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. See, there is no reason, there's no reasoning for you to pray, or I to pray, for a sin unto death, twice dead. Because I was dead in trespasses. Let me give you that scripture where you look at it. Ephesians 2 and 1 said, And you were dead in trespasses and sin. See, uh, and you hath he quickened, quickened you through the Holy Ghost. Well, just baptism quickened you, who were dead in trespasses and in sin. That's your spirit. That's your soul. See, the body was not dead in trespasses and sin. The body is a living temple. It had never died. It was born to die, but it had never died. But when your body came forth from the womb of your mother, your spirit and your soul was dead concerning God. Concerning God, your spirit, you were dead. But why were you dead? Because of original sin. Because of the curse. Brother Marlow, the, the child didn't sin. Uh, no, but the original father sin. The curse of death was upon all mankind. It's an inheritance. It's an inheriting. It's an inheritance. You, you inherit. Death. We had the sentence of death. Uh, the scripture said, I give you that scripture. The sentence of death. We were born to die. Man that is born of woman, Job 14 and 1, is of few days, full of trouble. Cometh forth like the flower and is cut down, fleeth as a shadow and continueth not. Uh, you know. Psalms 88 said, free among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. Say, free among the dead. Paul said, the widow that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. See, the spirit and the soul can be dead. It takes Christ to bring life to the spirit and soul. The widow that lives in pleasure. But she's dead while she lives. But she's at least living in pleasure. Um, uh, so, Brother Ferris. Go back into uh, Matthew 20, uh, how many months of 12 and 32, 31 and 20. Where he said, Therefore I say to you, every sin in life and they will be forgiven. Man, welcome again to spirit. Yeah. 
I do anything against the Son of Man, I will be forgiven. But if I do it to the Holy Spirit, I will never forgive. And this ain't going to come. That's why I said it. It's important to see that God the Father has so much authority as the Holy Spirit. Christ is forgiven. So if we do anything against him, he will forgive us. But if we do something against the Holy Spirit, it's not forgiveness. That's why I said in uh, Ephesians, uh, hold your Ephesians 2 and 1, but Ephesians 4, 29 and 30, grieve not, grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed under the day of redemption. That's what seals you. Holy Spirit being intact, being present, living in you. That's your seed. So you don't want to breathe that. I think Hebrews 6, 4 explains it that clears on the out. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have that just on that exact verse, but uh, read it. It says, for it is impossible for those who, those who have once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify themselves, the Son of God, afresh and put him to an open death. That's why they can't be forgiven because they it's actually are there. It's clear. They, he actually equates the ungodly sinner, the blasphemer of the Holy Ghost, with a person that would take Christ back to the cross, nail him there, crucify him again, put him to open shame. He makes them the same level. The, Paul does. The writer Paul does. He said they, they, they crucified to themselves afresh, or well, they do it again. They repeat, nailing <coughs> Christ to the cross. What they, done back there. what they did back there, the most ignominious sin ever upon the face of, no sin was ever as grievous as them crucifying Christ. I have a question. Yes. Um, people that are saved, <coughs> sinner, the one that can't repent anymore, if they do repent, they're not accepted. Esau sought repentance, carefully with tears, mm -hmm. Hebrews 12, but he found it not. Now, when I cannot find repentance anymore, at that moment, I'm not only shaming Christ, but I am crucifying him afresh putting him back on the cross, nailing him there, stripping him there, shaming him there, because I no longer can repent. No longer can he justify me. Another scripture that comes in there, you have to get it, is Hebrews, um, uh, Hebrews 10, isn't it? Uh, where he said, um, there remaineth there remaineth no more sacrifice or sin. In other words, you, you just can't go back and find any sacrifice uh, for sin. Um, 
let me see where we got that. Uh, yes, um, Hebrews 10 and 26 and 27. Uh, for if we sin willfully, our, our will is in it now, after that we have received, after, not before, <coughs> we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. <clears throat> if you don't have a sacrifice for sin, your sin can't be removed. And Christ is our sacrifice, but he's not there. <coughs> Excuse me. He falls out of the way or he's out of the way, and then we have a certain fearful looking, verse 27, for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. So uh, I think that when we cross that Rubicon, that perimeter there, that we shame Christ where there is no more repentance. There cannot be, and if we grieve the Holy Spirit so. Sister, oh. I'll come back to Ginger and then back to Tyler. The crux of the matter is then to be, to cultivate sensitivity. To cultivate sensitivity, sensitivity. yes. Cultivate sensitivity. sensitivity. Be tender. Paul said in that scripture I quoted, uh, Ephesians 4, 29, but be you kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ has forgiven you, um, not letting a root of bitterness spring up in you, defiling many. Uh, uh, Ginger. My question is about what is the continuum or crossing point, boundary, uh, or relationship, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, between disobedience and sin is disobedience sin and the reason uh, I'll skip the story but um, Christ had to learn obedience by the things that he suffered and but he didn't sin no. and yet he had to suffer why would he have to learn obedience he and the father were one they understood each other he said he only spoke those things that the father gave him and so my question for our own lives is, are there things that we, are there, well, let's call them little foxes, okay, that, that spoil our life. Um, are there, are, are there subtle things in our lives that, that are, in effect, disobedient, but not sin? Or not, is, is there a difference? I have to hinge here. <laughs> uh, I cannot separate disobedience, just willful disobedience, no. my will involved. Now, I can separate ignorant disobedience, right. not knowing. Right. Just not understanding God's will. I'm in a quandary. I'm perplexed. I'm frustrated. I don't understand God's will. I've been there. I've been there. I've been where I could not. I was frustrated. I'm perplexed. I was confused. Mm -hmm. Now, in doing that, I wasn't obedient. Uh, and I don't believe God judged me as being in willful sin in that case. I have also been in willful disobedience and was severely judged of God. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have died in that incident uh, when I stopped a revival in, in Illinois where God was moving in a great way. And because I wanted to visit a minister in Memphis, Tennessee, I stopped that revival. And God was just thundering life down on that place. And there's no telling what he would have come to. Possibly another Azusa Street. That was how powerful it was. But I had this will in me to see this man. 
I valued him. I liked him. I kept reasoning myself to be right. I've been here five days. I've preached hard. I want to go and see this man. I did. I got to Memphis, Tennessee to have dinner with him. I had the headache devouring my body. I could not eat. I went to the church. I could not speak. Blinding headache. Staggering. Upchecking. Uh, just everything making me so sick. I went to the motel. And it would not leave me. I got up at 4.30 in the morning, drive back to pick up my mother-in-law in southern Illinois, bring her down here for the birth of our child. And that blind headache, God let me go between Covington, Memphis, Tennessee, Covington, U.S. 51. Suddenly, God severely taught me. Um, I, I slipped out from behind a Mayflower van, and there was a car head on. And 65 miles an hour, uh, and careening off the road through a barbed wire fence, snapping a telephone pole, and uh, going up in the roof of that car. No seat belts, and blood streaming down my face. And the little voice within, the Holy Spirit said, never had men's person in admiration. Don't desire man, desire me, my will. Let me live. It was, it was miraculously given the grace to me. I learned the lesson that night that I brought it on through willful disobedience to God. So I believe willful disobedience because first, and I'll get your thought, first uh, Samuel is it or second Samuel 15 and 23, I believe, 15 and 13 right in there, you see the first or second Samuel, God, so, uh, um, Samuel said to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. And to hearken better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as the sin of idolatry. So, you know, those are things we have to be very careful with. Cultivate in our life. And I'm, I'm watching it now very closely in my life. Uh, God changed my mind on a major issue this over this last weekend. And I was in a quandary. I was confused about what to do to do His will in my ministry. And the Lord cleared it up. But I sought God in prayer. I'm not, going to find, I'm not going to have the favor of men by doing that. You seldom obey God and have the favor of men. Amen. You seldom obey God and have the favor of men. That's right. Most of the time, when you obey God, it draws man's disfavor. Amen. Because man is carnal. I didn't say spiritual man. Who knoweth the things of God, say the Spirit of God, which is any. Who knoweth the things of man, say the Spirit of man, which is any. So I, I see that you have to be very careful. So my, my thought, now let's get one more thought on gender, and I'll split back here, Tyler, and then down to Brother Hank. Uh, he learned obedience. Yeah, he didn't say it. That just means that Christ went through an educational phase because he was man. As a scholar in school, he learned his lesson. God gave Jesus a lesson. He gave him 33 and a half years of academic study in the temple of man. And he learned 
obedience as a man. He knew obedience as the Son of God. And he did not fail his tests. He didn't violate his trust. He simply learned. You know, uh, he, he, he was given lesson upon lesson. The temptation in the wilderness. He learned obedience. Uh, the, all the times they reviled him and rebuked him and the disciples said, call fire down from heaven and devour these men. And Jesus learned obedience. You know not what spirit you're of. You know, um, on the cross, Father, forgive them. Learned obedience. Didn't sin. Didn't disobey God. He just learned obedience as a man. Uh, and in doing that, he became the author of our salvation. And in, you know, you bring many sons to glory. Uh, he, he, he went through that experience, became the captain of our salvation. Um, Tyler. Yes, um, I had a question about <clears throat> blaspheming the holy. Holy Ghost. Isn't that much like what Moses did when he came down with the tablets and slammed them down and in vain and the earth swallowed him up and he was no longer allowed to go into the garden? Well, Until Moses grieved God by breaking the tablets, <clears throat> but God made him repeat going back to the mountain. He didn't judge him eternally there. He didn't, he didn't and he could not have blasphemed the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Right. See, the Holy Ghost was not yet given until Christ came and was crucified and resurrected. See, so he could not have blasphemed. No one under the law could have blasphemed the Holy Ghost right. because the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Right. Okay, but, go ahead. But if it had been, wouldn't that be like, would it have been blasphemy? Say I mean, it again. Like, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is if someone's like, um, you know, like if you're in church and the Holy Spirit's working on you mm -hmm. and it's wanting you to open yourself up to it, but you let your flesh hold you back. No, that's not blasphemy. No, you would be grieving the Holy Spirit. You'd be grieving it. But not yeah, blaspheming. Not, not okay. So, uh, you, so you'd have to go to like a whole other level. Right, yes, people. you have to learn. You have to go through. Uh, read that Hebrews 6, Brother um, Tyler. It's a very good foundational chapter to read. Now, I want to get in a phase of this after Hank uh, and conclude it because I want the fullness of this question. Uh, Hank, go ahead. Well, back to Jesus, there's a scripture in there somewhere, it says one that teaches, teaches himself. Yeah, Romans too. Yeah. And uh, in uh, Hebrews, uh, when you know, remain of no more sacrifice from sin, it's, but you must have the knowledge of the truth. Now, there's a lot of people think they have the knowledge. Right. They think that. Right. right. But having it and thinking you have it's a different, different thing. thing altogether. See, you don't, you, that's why I say that blaspheming the Holy Ghost is not something to be feared mm -hmm. because if you have knowledge, yeah. that knowledge you have <coughs> is teaching you stay away from the edge of the canyon. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't get up there and blaspheme no. the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that's a barrier. The Holy Spirit becomes a barrier. He guides you. He leads, you. he leads you away from the canyon. Leads you away. You have to become a vile person, a profane person, as Esau was, that sold his birthright. You have to sell your birthright. Your birthright. No, you don't sell your birthright. You're born again. You're born again to receive life eternal. You you have life eternal. You have life eternal. You're born to receive that. Uh, that's your birthright. 
So you would have to settle that. Just willfully walk away from it. Willfully deny it. Willfully say, I don't want any more of it. To blaspheme <clears throat> the Holy Ghost. You may grieve the Holy Ghost. You don't want to do that. But that's not blaspheming the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is bumping you back. Bumping you back. So you shouldn't fear, not giving us a spirit of fear, but you should have knowledge, and that knowledge will teach you 